Honourable Rector, Vice-Chancellors, Secretary-General, Civic and Academic Authorities, Professor Font, ladies and gentlemen. In thanking you for the honour you've done me today, I'm trying to work out why I feel so hugely honoured by it. I think I know the reason. It's more than just the public reputation of this great and ancient university. And by the way, I'm delighted to learn that this university was, I think, possibly the only one in Spain to celebrate the centenary of Darwin in 1909. And it's a special pleasure for me to be here in 2009 on the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. I would also like to thank Dr. Font for his beautiful address, which I was able to listen to since I was furnished with an English translation. It reads beautifully in English, and I'm sure it read even better in Spanish. I appreciate not only the wonderful language and the very kind things he said about me, but the sheer effort and work that he must have put into preparing it, and the way it showed, if I may say so, such a deep comprehension of everything that I've tried to do throughout my life. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Font. This university is part of the great international enterprise of scholarship, which knows no borders and speaks the same language of truth, even if in different tongues. The particular variety of truth that concerns me is scientific truth, and that is what I mostly want to talk about today. So what is this thing called science? The great medical scientist Peter Medawa called it the art of the soluble. T.H. Huxley, whom Dr. Font just mentioned as Darwin's bulldog, called it organized common sense. But for Lewis Wolpert, another distinguished biologist, it is so counterintuitive as to be almost the opposite of common sense. My own definition is the study of what is true about the real world. And I would emphasize the methods and attitude of science rather than just the current body of knowledge which may be subject to revision in future times. But surely it will be said there are many paths to the truth. Science is just one of them. There are important kinds of truth which science cannot touch. I agree that no experiment can establish, say, what is right and wrong, or can prove aesthetic judgments. But I think that the limitations of science have been exaggerated. It's sometimes said, science explains the how of things, but it is silent about the why. Others say, science answers immediate questions, but ultimate questions are outside and beyond it. Or, there are matters which are too complicated for science, and therefore must be studied in other ways. My answer is, what other ways? If it is too complicated for science to understand, what on earth makes you think that any other discipline will succeed where science has failed? I could make a case that science is capable of answering most, if not all, of the questions that most people think of as ultimate questions or why questions. And if there are fundamental questions that can never be answered by science, I suspect that they cannot be answered at all. The reason I went into science, the reason I stay in science, and the inspiration for my books is precisely that it does answer ultimate questions. I find it genuinely sad that so few people seem to know that we can now give straightforward, easy to understand answers to ultimate questions like, why do we exist? What is life for? There are other deep questions to which we don't yet know the answer, questions about consciousness, for example. But if there is an answer, science will find it. As a child obsessed with music, I met a leading bassoon player who argued that the only true international language was music. If you gather together an Australian, a Hungarian, a Japanese, and a Spaniard, none of whom speaks a word of each other's languages, they will stare at each other speechlessly. But if they happen to be a string quartet, 
and you give them appropriate sheet music, they will communicate together with harmony and exquisite coordination. Music is an international language. Science is communicated in different particular languages, English, Spanish, French, or Japanese, say. But at a deeper level, science is more international even than music. There is no such thing as Japanese science as distinct from British science or Spanish science, although there is Japanese music. Scientists are looking at the universe, and the universe is the same, whatever your culture. Also, I am prepared to insist. It is fashionable to proclaim the opposite. Modish voices prattle through academic corridors about relativism. No, this has nothing to do with Einstein, would that it had. This idea comes not from that peerless giant of the intellect, but from the opposite end of the spectrum of intelligence, folk who call themselves cultural relativists. Science, we hear, is not a privileged road to truth, just the product of a particular culture, white, Western, and male. The scientific view of the universe is no more worthy of respect than the cosmology of a tribe of New Guinea Highlanders. There is no truth, only cultural beliefs, and all cultural beliefs are equally valid. There is a literary version of this conceit. All texts are of equal literary merit. Don Quixote is no more worthy of scholarly attention than Quentame.